Pokemon. Who doesn't love Pokemon? I mean, a fun game about these cute, cuddly creatures with magic powers? I mean, look at them. They're just great. Except for the ones that steal children. I'll be real, I'm not really a big fan of those. Pokemon has dabbled in the realm of horror a surprising amount. From creepy Pokedex entries, to ghost girls appearing behind you out of nowhere, to actual decomposing Pokemon. Oh my god, the manga has a lot of issues. Pokemon is absolutely no stranger to horror. And what I'm getting at is that since Pokemon already contains these creepy elements, it really helped out another part of the franchise, the fan game scene. I consider scary Pokemon fan games a bit unique compared to other scary scary fan games because a lot of these games are already based on pre-existing creepy ass elements from the original games, which is pretty cool. Not only that, but these games have been being made consistently for like a decade or so at this point, so there's quite a few to choose from. With all that being said, since it is November, the month that Pokemon stuff happens, well, maybe not this year, but you can just ignore that, I'll be playing a bunch of different Pokemon horror games and seeing which games are scary, what aged well, or if it's just plain bad. I'll be talking about five games here today, but there are a lot of these things, so if you want me to talk about more, let me know in the comments. Now, let's start off with one that I've known about the longest, Escape from Life. Lavender Town. Now, how have I known about a silly little Pokemon horror game for over a decade? Uh, Jacksepticeye played it for some reason. Created by Adrian Detrick, Escape from Lavender Town is a classic Pokemon creepypasta game about escaping from Lavender Town. So, a quick explanation as to why Lavender Town is so prominent in horror content for Pokemon. Basically, there are a lot of old creepypastas about the original Lavender Town from Pokemon Red and Blue. One creepypasta talks about hidden frequencies in the town's theme that would give you depression and kill children. Another creepypasta was about this goofy zombie in white hand that would like kill you or something? I don't know, but the message here is that Lavender Town is f***ed up. Onto the actual game, it starts up with a warning message in the style of the original DS that reads that this game tends to break the fourth wall, which is a not so subtle clue of what's to come next. Another message pops up right before you play and god damn it, did I download the Spanish version? I'll just splice together both the English and Spanish footage, we do not skip content on this channel. The game claims that when it ends, your life will too. It also tells you to turn up the music so you can hear its hidden frequencies, surely blasting the Lavender Town theme will have no negative side effects. The game finally begins, and god damn it is tiny. I didn't realize you could full screen it during this part, so I played this game on a window the size of a cheese it You have to navigate around Lavender Town, mostly talking to the NPCs, who all seem to be pretty sad for some reason. I mean, except this dude, I think I could guess why he's upset. Also, who opens up a conversation like that? Hey, what's going on? Oh yeah, I have a terminal illness. Talk to some town residents, a child, a member of Team Rocket who's really proud about killing a Pokemon's family, and really? That's all there is to do. You can enter the Pokemon Tower, however, after talking to the lady behind the front desk, it's revealed that this game's not actually finished. Too bad I can't read how to actually leave the game. I think it's cut off on purpose so that you have to figure it out. The Spanish version comes in clutch though and just straight up tells you. So the way to actually escape from Lavender Town is to hit the escape key. Adoy! After realizing that the game wasn't finished, I hit escape and the game was over. Okay, well, at least the game's not small anymore. As mentioned at the beginning, this game does break the fourth wall and does a fake out close when you hit escape. After some honestly pretty cool Lavender Town art, the game locks you into full screen, the music gets a lot crazier, and the game just goes full on silly mode. Oh, also images flash on your screen constantly. Lots of blood is assured. Talking to the NPCs now, they just kinda yell at you that you're gonna die. Once again, the Spanish version here was just so much more enjoyable. Going into Pokemon Tower, you have to walk past a bunch more NPCs that not only tell you to perish, but that know your computer name? This was one of the first horror games I saw as a kid that would break the fourth wall, and oh my god, it was terrifying. I'm sorry, he's gonna kill me? Run? Don't have to tell me twice, I'm getting out of here. Reach the end of the hallway where an old man tells you that the game was actually made for you, and the hidden frequencies in the game's theme can demolish your brain, leaving you dead. 
That is until the game says, just kidding, and hit you with some calm music and a colon P. And that's the end of Escape from Lavender Town. It's super short and simple, and I won't lie, it's very cheesy, but it holds a nostalgic place in my heart as it was one of the first creepypasta games I had seen. Shout out my boy Jack. It's by no means great, hell, it's not even that good, but back in the day, it was a neat short horror experience that I'm happy to cover. Speaking of classic Pokemon creepypastas, the next game on the list is Hypno's Lullaby. I always thought this one was hilarious as a kid because why did this man have a whole ass theme song? Hypno's Lullaby is a Pokemon ROM hack made by, I believe, 7G06 that's based on the creepypasta of the same name. The gist of the creepypasta was that there was this Hypno who took away children and sang a goofy song about it. This creepypasta actually gained some huge popularity in the past couple years thanks to Friday Night Funkin'. I swear, that game has revived god knows how many creepypastas for a new generation, which is cool, but whoever thought that Hypno's Lullaby would be making a comeback in the 2020s. Anyways, let's get into the game. It opens up like a normal Pokemon game, except the opening has a quick blurb about children going missing on Three Island. Some say it was a yellow Pokemon that was spotted doing it. <gasps> it was you! The normal Professor Oak opening will play. You could choose a name, choose your character, have Professor Oak explain that his grandson has gone missing and could possibly be dead. You know, the usual Pokemon stuff. After this, the game begins, and after choosing between Pokemon, which I chose Vulpix, you can venture out of the house. The town's pretty aware about what's going on, mostly talking about the disappearances and one kid even being stuck just saying Hypno over and over. Why they don't just move at this point or hyperbeam the ever-loving hell out of the forest? Not a clue. You can begin moving into Berry Forest, where all the children keep disappearing. There's also a policeman guarding it, but he, all he does is warn you not to go in and that's it. Why would you let another child into the child disappearing forest? Just like all police, he's pretty useless. Moving deeper into the forest, you begin to hear a Pokemon screech, as after one last warning sign to turn back, you encounter a little girl. This is where everything immediately goes to hell, because the second you try to comfort the crying girl, she immediately switches up and it turns out she's actually working with Hypno, who promptly attacks you. Being just a tad underleveled for this fight, Hypno one-shots your Pokemon and knocks you out cold. You then wake up in Hypno's cave, where this one person is just kinda chilling and isn't actually in danger or anything, I think. You walk past tons of NPCs who don't seem to do anything until you fall down a hole into the lost chamber. This time, you pass some geezer and then some dead geezer until you fall down another hole into Hypno's cave. This starts another Pokemon battle, but instead of fighting Hypno, no, you have to fight some of Hypno's victims. Sorry for scorching you alive, kid, my bad. You can drop down yet another hole and now you're in the souls chamber? Okay, this game just making it up as it goes at this point. In this area, you have random encounters with ghosts that you can't actually fight, so you have to run away. You finally find Hypno, ready for a rematch. Unfortunately, Hypno puts you to sleep once again and you wake up in the one, the only, Lavender Town! Because God forbid you have a scary Pokemon game without Lavender Town. You now appear to be stuck in your own dreams and you once again have to fight Hypno. This time, the kids you fight are level 100, but all they could do was put you to sleep, so burning them alive just took a little bit longer. Navigating through the Pokemon Tower, you come across Hypno one last time who uses Dream Eater and traps you in this white void ending the game. Or at least a loser would end it there. Determined to go back and kill Hypno for revenge, I tried running a ton of cheats on my game to try and defeat Hypno. However, in doing so, I think I accidentally created an entirely different Pokemon horror game and not wanting to deal with these horrifying glitch noises at one in the morning, I called it quits. Hypno's lullaby was, uh, something. The beginning was promising, but it kind of falls off hard after your first battle with Hypno. Zero original sprites, lots of similar similar areas and area names, and an underwhelming ending adds to a lackluster horror experience. Honestly, I'd recommend you just play the Friday Night Funkin' mod at this point. I've never played it, but hey, it looks a lot cooler than this. However, Hypno's Lullaby isn't the only game to be revived by Friday Night Funkin'. In fact, this game is probably one of the most popular Pokemon creepypastas out there. We're talking about Lost Silver. <laughs> Lost Silver? What are you talking about? He's right here! <laughs> Lost Silver, the iconic creepypasta game made by Reed Maxwell. This game was based on a creepypasta by the same name about a haunted copy of Pokemon Silver. I absolutely loved this game as a kid. I would always watch the video Jaywitz made on it, but did the game age well? Let's find out. 
Now, I did play through the original game from 2011, however, for the sake of this video, I'll be using footage from both the classic game and Re-Lost Silver, which is a new version of Lost Silver made by the same person who made the OG game. I did this because both of the games were being a little silly and weren't letting me get the endings that I wanted. Even though I'm using footage from the remake, I want to focus on what was in the original game. Maybe in the future, I'll take a look at the additional content added in the remake. Booting this game up, there's no title screen, no menu, nothing. You immediately get thrown into this room with nothing but a staircase in the middle, and walking down the staircase you come across a dark hallway and you can't see anything. This is where you can check your inventory, and you see that you have six Pokemon, five unknown that spell out the word leave, and a Cyndaquil with one HP named Hurry. You can use Flash that Cyndaquil knows to light up the room, which took me a whole restart of the game to figure out because I'm silly. Walk down the end of the hallway, and once you finally reach the end, you're presented with a sign that tells you to leave now, and you can either answer yes or no. This is where you begin the actual game, and go down the path of one of two endings. I'll start with what happens if you say yes. So god forbid I do what the sign tells me to do, because as soon as I chose yes, the game killed my Cyndaquil immediately. Not cool game. You may be wondering how I know that Cyndaquil is for sure dead, it's because if you go into your bag again after this, you now have six unknown that quite literally spell it out for you, reading he died. After reading this, you get sent to a, uh, cemetery? There's no time to react to this though, because as soon as that happens, you get sent to another place, this weird red dimension, and your character is now white. You. Exploring this new red dimension, you pass NPCs who just kinda stare at you until you encounter who I assume is red. You're immediately challenged to a battle where red sends out a level 255 Pikachu? That doesn't seem fair, but alright. You send out a shiny Celebi, and the only option you have is to use Parish Song. Pikachu will try attacking you while the Parish Song counter goes down using various attacks such as Flail and Frustration. One cool detail I learned while making this video is that frustration is a move in Pokemon that depends on the level of friendship between the Pokemon and the trainer. Basically, the lower the friendship level is, the stronger the attack, and Pikachu's frustration in this game does pretty much all of your health. It might explain why Pikachu looks so sad, and is a cool little detail to add into the game. Anyways, the Parish Song counter hits zero and both Pokemon faint. Red didn't seem to take the loss very well though, because he just f***ing decapitates himself out of anger, I guess. After the fight, you're transported into a house and you're now invisible. Phasing through the walls, you wander downstairs until reaching an NPC that tells you goodbye and uses the attack Nightmare. This transports you back to the cemetery from before and now looking at your Pokemon, the unknown you have read I'm dead. You can't move, you can't do anything, you're stuck on the screen as the letters RIP appear, signaling the end of the first ending. With that route ended, it's on to the second one. Going back to the sign from earlier, this time if you choose no, and I mean really choose no, you gotta spam that shit. The sign disappears and you're now stuck moonwalking. The game just must really hate the player, because even though I said yes before and the game got mad, this time it gets mad again when I say no, and all of your Pokemon are replaced with red-eyed unknown that just read too bad. Moonwalking your way back up the hallway, you come across this dark red maze area instead of the area from the beginning. All of a sudden, you get teleported into this cave system, but this time you have no eyes. Now you have four X-shaped unknowns in your inventory, but you also have a Typhlosion and an egg as well. Something then, uh, happens? to your Typhlosion, I guess, and he disappears from your party. I'm not really surprised though, he didn't have any eyes, bro probably just wandered off a cliff or something. The egg then hatches, revealing another Cyndaquil, and the unknown now spelled Deny. Wandering through a cave system and out into a black and white area, you encounter someone who seems to have a Feraligator that just says where. This Pokemon's seen better days though, why is everybody in this game blind? After being this trainer, they then say even, and then disappear, so, alright. <laughs> Exploring onward, you finally reach civilization, in the form of a town with a bunch of NPCs just standing in various places. Every time you interact with an NPC, a different unknown pops up, and the NPC disappears soon after. I'm not sure what the hell this means, but I just ran around getting every NPC until I got transported to the same town, but purple. Or pink, I don't know. There's now a line of NPCs that as you walk past and interact with them, they spell out the phrase, who are you kid? Now I know there's gotta be a story to all of this, but pfft, hell if I can decipher it. After this, you come across this room that's very similar to the starting room. Actually, it's almost exactly like the starting room, which confused me a lot. The game seems to repeat itself from here. If it weren't for the lack of eyes and a few minor differences, I would have totally thought the game glitched out or something. Sadly, however, this is where the original game would end 
as you could either choose yes and go through that first ending again, or choose no and the game would break when you get to the trainer again. At least that's what happened to me when I played it. I can't find any footage online saying otherwise, so I think that's the canon Toad Bup no ending. Lost Silver was a great creepypasta game, mostly because it stood out among the other creepypasta games at the time. It really honed in on the confusing haunted nature of the game, and made a creepy experience without the overuse of blood and constant jump scares, and also left a lot of room for interpretation. I mean, look at all the content made around the OG game and story now. This game truly aged well, and I'm glad it's getting the attention it deserves. That was actually kind of confusing. I think I need the next game to be something a little bit more my brain capacity. Now that's what I'm talking about. Created by Joe XV, Pokemon Cursed Version is indeed a cursed version of Pokemon. It's a Halloween ROM hack of Fire Red, there's not much else to really say about it, so let's just dive right in. And let me just say, you know you're in for a great experience when the first thing you see after the intro is stolen fan art. Off to a great start, here's the creator of the art by the way. You can now create your character, to which I named him Null. I don't want to name him anything and get too attached if something happens, you know? The game starts and you're in your bedroom. Grab your Marowak and potions out of the room and hit the town. You may be wondering why your character is wearing a silly little costume, it's actually because you're going trick-or-treating in Saffron City from Pokemon Red. You can talk to some NPCs to get rare candies, kids on the street that for some reason aren't paying any attention to anything, and once you've gotten all of the candy, you're allowed to fight the gym trainer. It turns out that Sabrina, the Saffron City gym leader, is your character's mom, and you two have a battle. Now, if you weren't dumb like me while playing this game and rare candied and replaced your Pokemon's moves, you could sweep pretty easily by one-shotting Drowsy and then using Foresight on Sabrina's Gengar to use normal attacks on the ghost type. Now, I didn't know this while I was leveling up my Marowak, and I got rid of Foresight, which lets me attack her Gengar, and I just reset the game in defeat and did it all over again. Once you beat Sabrina, she congratulates you and tells you not to go near Sylph Co. Of course, after this, you immediately go near Sylph Co. But wait, there's a guard blocking the door. You have four options, and I just chose to flex on the officer so hard that he just had to let me pass. It worked like a charm. Walking around the building, the place seems pretty abandoned. As you walk up more and more floors, you will eventually run into scientists that are refusing to talk to you. I will say the high energy music is making this a little less creepy, but I mean, at least it's good music. Eventually, you run into a scientist who actually isn't a scientist at all, but a haunter. Pray that you could use foresight fast enough before haunter confuses you so that you could two-shot the Pokemon and move on. Once you defeat this first haunter, you obtain something called ghost pieces. These come in handy when attempting to get a different ending, but we'll get to that. Continue making your way up the tower until you finally encounter the one behind it all. None other than a ghost chilling on the couch. I mean, come on, how could he be evil? He's so chill. The ghost claims that they were actually expecting you. They were a spirit of a trainer who was experimented on and killed by the Sylph Co. And now the ghost wants revenge. Our brave protagonist makes the statement that the ghost shouldn't kill everyone and now you have to best them in a fight. However, this fight's just ever so simply lopsided in their favor, so despite my best efforts, efforts, I was killed immediately. The ghost takes away your Marowak as you run away. The game ends on the screen of the character buried alive and a couple of ghosts, revealing that the ghost killed all of the humans and ate their flesh. Not without saving the bones though, they might be murderers but they would never waste food. And this is the end of the bad ending, however, if you were to obtain all of the ghost pieces, you can actually come across an elevator that will take you to the cemetery. This one scientist dude apparently is the one behind everything, and is also your father, I guess? You beat your dad and his Pokemon to death while your mom beats the ghost to death. Why we weren't able to beat the ghost, but our mom could beat the ghost even though we beat her earlier? Pfft, uh -huh. Anyways, beat the bad guy, save the day, the end. This game wasn't exactly long, and it may not have been nearly as creepy or scary as other Pokemon horror games, but I didn't think it was that bad. I mean, there was some gameplay to it, at least more than Escape from Lavender Town had, so I had that going for it. It was just a silly short Halloween ROM hack, and I don't really have much negative or positive to say about it. Actually, that's a complete lie, don't steal fan art. We're finally to the last game on the list, and this one's probably the most recent one I've talked about so far. Okay, now stay with me. Imagine if you played Pokemon Gold, but you could throw hands with the Pokemon. I know, it's a dream come true. Okay, fist fighting Pokemon isn't what the game's about, but you can still do it. Pokemon Corrupt Gold is a game made by Professor Creepypasta, who's actually been featured on this channel before. I played their Misfortune.gb game they made a while back. 
Let's get right into the game. And is that an RPG Maker reference? <gasps> Let's go, I love RPG Maker! Name your character, grab a potion from your computer, and venture around the town. I immediately went for Professor Elm's lab. However, as soon as you approach the professor, everything goes black and white, and the new figure takes the professor's place. The figure tells you there is no professor here and engages in battle. This is where you get to beat the shit out of an evil Cubone. I'm telling you, I could easily beat any Pokemon in a fist fight. After you defeat the Cubone, you're able to pick a starter Pokemon, but sadly, this does mean you can no longer fisticuff with the animals. I chose the goat Totodile and gave them a smiley face. Also, there's this bloody Cyndaquil chilling outside the lab for some reason. Navigating your way through the glitches to the top of the foresty area you're in, you find a building. Your reward for getting through this forest safely is now you're in complete static and just have to fight a random Binette. After you beat the Pokemon, you're in this weird double hallway. There are random encounters after this, but I've discovered that you could just always flee successfully, so that was pretty much my go-to strat for the rest of the area. Going back outside, you get a friendly warning to us. Thanks, game. Walk past these glitching NPCs, walk past more glitching NPCs, and you finally reach your first sign of civilization. All of the people here are just speaking complete gibberish, most likely succumbing to the deterioration of the universe. The shopkeepers are fine though, they're just chilling. How the game works from here on out is like an abridged version of a Pokemon game. You encounter a town, you stock up on potions, fight your way to a boss, and repeat, all while glitches have overcome your screen. After fighting through some classic scary Pokemon ghosts, the first boss you fight is called Cella Mew, which is a fusion of Celebi and Mew, who could also maybe be a reference to Lost Silver? I don't know, could be reading too much into it. After this, you go to another town and you pass through some dark corridors where you could fight the second boss, Unknown V, which is a combination of EV and Unknown. Listen, I appreciate the idea of these Pokemon fusing together due to the glitching universe, but like also Unknown V? That's not the goofiest name you'll see though, don't you worry. Anyways, this next area has without a doubt the wackiest name for a Pokemon I have ever seen. You Knuckle. Like, come on game, you can't make Shuckle scary, especially if you name him You Knuckle. The next boss is Unknown King, a lot of unknown fused Pokemon in this game. Wish they kept doing things like Selamu, but it's whatever. Wait. Unknown King is a real creepypasta? He has a Friday Night Funkin' mod? I told you every creepypasta has a mod. Anyways, after this, you can fight your way up to the final boss of this game. You encounter the entity responsible for everything in this glitched fuzzy room. The final boss is simply called Corruption, and they're just an amalgamation of sprites. Spam Scratch and Potions, and you'll be able to beat them just fine. The second you beat the game, everything just immediately turns back to normal, and you get the good ending. Now, the bad ending just has you losing to Corruption, and it's pretty much the same. Oh god! Gosh, I lost! The end. I mean, this game had an interesting concept. Finding your way through a slowly corrupting world trying to stop it is kinda cool, and I did like the design of corruption, even if it was just a bunch of sprites strung together. This game does kinda overdo it on the glitches though. I get it's a corrupted world, but sometimes it's really annoying being constantly bombarded by static and glitches, and that goes for some of the audio too. A lot of high-pitched tones just randomly thrown in there. Overall, it wasn't bad, but wasn't anything mind-blowing. If you're looking for a short, modern creepypasta game, you could do way worse. And that was the slightly Lavender Town-filled world of Pokemon horror games. Like I mentioned before, there are a lot of these things I couldn't talk about, such as Snow on Mount Silver, and I do want to talk about the Lost Silver remake. Pokemon creepypasta games are honestly more nostalgic for me compared to like Sonic EXE or Mario horror games, so maybe I'm a bit biased when it comes to playing them, but even with that, I'll admit some of these games were lackluster. I'm glad we've got a whole new era of Pokemon creepypasta fans to continue the horror fan game scene, and I'm looking forward to whatever's in store for the future. I've definitely learned that not every Pokemon horror game is good. I mean, do you remember like eight years ago when Markiplier played Pikachu.exe on his channel? That's all I've got to say about it. Honestly, I just thought it was funny that that happened. Yeah.